Okay, we're on. All right, we're, uh, we're going to kick off the Policy and Review Committee meeting. It's Monday, April 24th at 6 p.m. Uh, all members of the committee are in attendance, as well as Mr. Harris um, and Mr. Uh, Hurley. No members of the public at this time. Um, so real quick, cleaned out a lot of old business last time, which was great. We have, oh, yeah, we can do the Pledge of Allegiance, sorry. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. So, um, we don't have to end early as we anticipated. We thought we were going to have to end early, but apparently uh, that situation has been handled. So, as far as old business goes, um, we cleaned out most of it. Every All those 113s are now in some stage of uh, review for the board. Um, if you look at your agenda on the this, 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 the, the following headings under new business I asked um, Kathy to sort of keep us um, up to date on the policies that have passed through so she's going to on here she's going to keep tabs on like what's in first reading, what's in second reading if there's anything under legal review like we had the 113's under legal review so that we can kind of watch stuff fall off the, the list so the, the agenda is really just the top portion and everything else is more just a running status of everything that we, that we cover. Um, so I thought this was really nice because we could kind of watch things pass through and fall off and, um, you know, and then again, the, the, the future TVD policies. So that's the way we're going to set up the agenda going forward and we'll keep track of things that way. So let me know if, um, you know, if, if that's, uh, if you have any other suggestions or if, if that's working for you. So as far as old business, the only thing we really had to look at was um, the policy 209, which we started looking at last last month. And we, we said we were going to continue to review this one. Um, but this was a brand new, it came from PASBA. Um, we had talked about editing some of this stuff. I think, you know, Rob brought up the, um, in, under the guidelines, first section, that it's 10th uh, grade uh, for the physical. And then the tuberculosis test was stricken because we don't do that anymore. And then the other thing we talked about was the, the, the issue in the, in the last paragraph on the page. Um, if the parent or guardian fails to report the action taken, the school nurse or school physician shall arrange a special medical examination for the student. And I think that's where we kind of, that's where we ended, but that's where we started getting into some discussion around what is our responsibility versus what's the responsibility of the parent. Um, I can add some color here on the first piece. Uh, the current PA code has 6th and 11th grade as being for the physical screenings. Um, Daniel Boone has uh, obtained a waiver for that, okay, for the physical screenings uh, from PD and the paperwork's been approved and by the, what is it, Secretary of Health or whatever. Um, I did reach out to them, so they have the paperwork on file. Um, so what we want to do is we want to add a clause, and the reason why this was apparently originated, this was years ago, um, was so that they corresponded with kids and then getting the driver's license, so a parent didn't have to get a physical and then get a physical again. You know, get a physical yeah. driver's license, then do it again. So um, I would suggest that we uh, work smith a, a sentence at the end of that, like where it says each student shall receive a comprehensive health examination conducted by the school and physician upon original entry in 6th grade and 11th grade. I would suggest a sentence after that um, that would read something to the effect that there, we are waived, and if a parent gets that ex physical examination any time in the previous year, that counts for that examination. So we need to just wordsmith a phrase right there on the end of that. Um, and just so you know, also, um, after talking with the Department of Health, we also have a waiver with the dental for the same thing. 
uh, which is at least for, which is good because it doesn't inconvenience our parents as much. Basically, if a parent can prove that they received a dental examination the year prior, um, they don't have to get another one. Basically, is what that's saying uh, for each one of those particular ways. So we just need to add a phrase to each one, and then uh, that will suffice. All right. Who would who, who would create that? Oh, we could do it right now. Um, let's see. Yeah, we, would do, we have a waiver for both. And I think it makes it easier for the families because if a parent takes a child to the dentist, for example, for their yearly checkup six months ago, and then they had to get another checkup on these dates, like in seventh grade, for example, then, then it would, that's an additional expense for the families. Basically, the intent of the law is there. The intent of the law is to make sure that the parents are, are maintaining their kids' health. And so and, um, the, if the parent has basically done that, then they're in good shape with would it make sense to just specify the policy unless as otherwise waived and just path to the waivers? Like should those oh, waivers be too. posted online rather than just institutional knowledge? Um, it's not, you just it's not posted anywhere online, the should waivers. They? Well, there's the Pennsylvania Department of Education or Pennsylvania Department of Health has that document somewhere in a folder up there. I mean, literally what I call up that data. That's something about Yeah, what? I don't know how to solve it. We don't own that. We don't own that document, though. And, um, but we should. We don't. You know, they have it, today, so we don't have it. So. We should find out how to get it. Should be on our files. For waived documents. I, I can't. We've gone through five administrations since then, so I don't exactly. have any idea where they filed that. Everything was done manually by hand. Sure, they can get us a copy. I'm sure they can. Absolutely. I don't know how the rest of the committee feels about that. So we have a waiver for both of those sections? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, do we need a copy of the, do we need to understand the provisions of the waiver to ensure that? We know what they are. I mean, I, I literally spoke to someone you know, from the Department of Health. All right. So it's what the parent of Mark is apparently that exam. Yes. Prior year. So you want to just offline work with Kathy on the phrasing you want to use, and then sure. we can just... Absolutely. I mean, what we can do is, if you want, I, I, I'll talk to her about it. We can just, if you guys want to add the phrasing in there, well, at least for that particular piece, maybe we can just email it to the group sure. and say, does anybody have an issue with it? Okay. As far as a, a copy of the waiver... Um, I mean, is that difficult to get a copy? I'll, I'll reach out and see if they can provide us with a copy. I, mean, should, I, I think it does make it does, it does make sense for yeah. us to have it. Just I have so no we, trouble doing that. I can reach out, and uh, I'm sure they can provide us a copy. Do you agree? Copy. That's. No. I mean, just. I mean, just a copy. I mean, we don't have I'll to have. Wait, it. I will ask them and they'll provide us with a copy. Because then, I mean, you know, who knows? Maybe it's something missing in it, and we don't. You, know, you might read it and go, "Wait a minute, we missed something." Yeah. So that could be the whole prior prior year. Yes, the whole prior year. Um, they don't want to start as they said, I school year. It's, a, it's, it's, like it's, the, it's from July, from speaking with Suzanne on the phone, it was like from basically it goes by the schools, believe it or not, the physical year, so it's like uh, July 1st. This, this school year. Yeah, it, that, that Scouts do the same thing, too. Who holds the waiver? The Department of Health? They, yeah, the Department of Health has it. Daniel Boone applied for it apparently years ago, as my understanding. Okay. Um, the last pa the, the last paragraph. The last paragraph. I don't recall exactly what the concern was, but. We had a, an issue with the if the parent guardian fails to report action taken, the school nurse or school physician shall arrange a special medical examination for the student. I, I just I circled it and wrote that the, that the team had further review on that. Which page is this on page? Three? The first page of the of policy two hundred nine. It's at the bottom in, in bold because most of this is.
basically if the school says the kid is you know visibly out of health or seemingly out of health that we can say that they need to have a physical we could tell the parent that they need to have the kid looked at and if they refuse then I guess at our expense we can it's make not arrangements we have to shout yeah so alright is that often happen that we tell a parent hey you have to have your child checked out the parent says no I think more often what you will see if a parent is not there's a threshold and it's a gray area if a parent is expecting a child and they have an obligation to report that to the children and the services are under the law as an educator. Oh, mandatory reporting? Or we are mandatory reporting as educators. So I think you'll see more of that. Most parents who work in schools, 99.999% are talking about very rarely, you know, once every two years we get a parent who is refusing um, any sort of advice that the school system. Okay, yeah, I'm fine. Yeah, it says in uh, one of the sections that, that's listed as, you'll see on there, it says uh, section number two, nine, and four. One of those is a uh, health services code, section 1402, and it basically says that the teachers are to report any unusual physical or you know, health, mental or health issues to the nurse. And then school physicians of each district shall make a medical examination and a comprehensive appraisal of the into the school in the Commonwealth. Um, and I think that's it doesn't say specifically, but that alludes to the, the regular health checks we do at sixth and eleventh grade. The only point that I'm making is when we adopt this it'll be on the administration to if a school nurse says a note at home, hey we believe your child needs to be checked out and if the parent says no then we must put this policy ensure that, that child is exactly that's the effect of the shower. Mm -hmm. As long as it's happening. Where does that stop? If you're getting appropriate to be the family. Oh, okay. that's a fine line. You know what I mean? That, that, that's a fine line. I think, it, it, just to come back to it, when we get into serious situations, the parent has to be cooperative, mm -hmm. it's usually a children's case. Um, it's both of the parties. So that's where we usually go about it. Yeah, we've never had like a mandate from the mandate that exists. Um, there is another question saying that the districts shall destroy student health records only after the student has not been enrolled in the district school for at least two years. So I guess that should be put on the record retention schedule if it's not. You're okay with it as is? Yeah, I was trying to find in the actual code, but I... These things are really challenging to... to read yeah, through, so man. <laughs> yeah, it does say in this 14... Uh, 1949 Act 14 what section? Uh, section C it's section 1406 article C it does say that um, the insurance company law of 1921 <laughs> um, paid for and provided to each school district of Pennsylvania uh, no later than the 15th school enrolling district I didn't see any I can't I mean I you know I don't see anything in any of these that say that we're liable to pay for it, but it sounds like that's what it's saying. Well, I think it's only saying we'd be liable, I guess, to pay for the examination we require, but well, from what I read, it doesn't say that we have to pay for medical treatment. I guess that would be on somebody else. Well, this is like an, a case-by-case -case thing where this isn't the 6th or 11th grade physical. Right. This yeah. is somebody seems to be off yeah. for a reason. And, okay. All right, so this is good as is. All right.
All right, so the only change on this then, we're just going to wait for the clause um, from Mr. Hurley. And otherwise we're... In reference to the waiver. Again, yeah, in reference yeah. to the waiver. Mr. Hurley's going to follow up to see if he can get a waiver. A copy of the waiver. Works. That language, however, yeah. Yeah, and then I'll have... I'll, just, I'll talk to Kathy, and then I'll just have her... Once you guys are done, we can... the waiver it's the it's the waiver for us that we're we allow students to to take the physical exam in the tenth grade, and then as far as the dental, if they have a dental if it's exam, if it's, around, if it's in that timeline, they can. We don't have to have them do it again. So okay. we either have to get the language from the waiver, put it in the policy, or we need the reference. I'll take your word for it. So I agree. That should be the only rule that has policy. Do we get the recommendation from the? All right. In record time, we're already on the new business. Um, now, <clears throat> if you look at the new business, the, the ones in red, those are the ones that Kathy sort of identified as um, like a prior as a priority that we should look at first. So does anybody have any objections to doing that? So 18.2. No, I guess so we should be easy to navigate these policies now. Look at that. You complain, I mean, ask really and you shall receive. It's a passage in the You didn't get my, you didn't hear my, my joke. No, I said your complaint, I mean, a suggestion is put into action. She was so happy, actually. It was it was actually nice because she was... Well, I wonder how many other cases there are like that where we're doing something and it may not be... Well, then she just didn't, didn't want to say... Anything. She didn't want to say anything. And I'm yeah. like, just... I'm like, listen, don't do that again. Like, if you... Mm-hmm. Um, all right. So, I, th- I guess we'll just start with 218 since it's one bit... We'll, we'll, we'll start with 218 and work our way through uh, 218 too. So the 218 is the general student discipline policy. Um, pretty much the entire section of this was, was redone uh, by PASBA. All of it is new language. The only thing I had really questions on was the um, the off campus stuff. I was just curious. Do you guys like when there's when students are doing school related activities off of school campus? Like, do we do we see a lot of disciplinary issues in those scenarios? Yeah, and well, the answer varies. You look at it, what's called a nexus. Like, for example, if you're off campus, if the kid's traveling from, they're walking home to, from school at 2.30 from the high school to their residence, say, on the 2nd Street in Birdsboro, and they get in a fight, we have the ability as a school district in transit right there, that would be an off-campus activity, to discipline that, a, a bus ride to a place where the child's riding a bus. The field have, trip or a yeah, yeah, oh yeah, field conference, of bus stop in the morning. Type of activity. Those are examples. There has to be a, a, a nexus. Um, where, where, you get, where it gets really gray, and you can do hypotheticals in all other places, is when, um, when something happens off campus and it rolls into school and it affects the learning environments of the, cla- of, of the classroom as a result of that. And um, the, if it affects our learning environment, then um, in theory, if it's affecting the learning environment, we have the prerogative to discipline the learning skills and the events. So it's all about that nexus, and boy, that, that gets to be a real gray area at times, what's disrupting the learning environment and things like that. Uh, so that, that's kind of rules and norms that administrators follow in regards to those things. Yeah, but students make it easy, because they'll send a text saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stab you tomorrow in school and bring a knife. So it, it kind of makes it easy when they threaten outside. And everything now is electronic, so th- there's always a record. And then they bring them up in school, and it's kind of a... That's how we caught most of them this year. 
common to make? This year, yes. Do we have any? Do you have any speculation as to what it is this year, or is it just I think no. coincidental? Just coincidental, probably. Um, as far as the uh, teachers, uh, on the second page, there's a delegation of responsibility that talks about teachers using reasonable force. Like, do, do we? Um, is there a training or anything that teachers go through as far as like how they're allowed to restrain a student? Yeah, and that, that's a great question. There, there's a training um, in particular. It's, you see it with um, where there's high risk situations. Um, say that there's a child um, who's identified. Um, yeah, I mean, I know, like, in special ed, like, there's, there's some kids that have no an outbursts or whatever, and, and you have something to... called safety care training um, that administrators have had, and, and, and um, like, when they're dealing with higher-risk situations, you know what I mean? Well, like, middle school, two seventh graders are fighting in the hallway. I see two seventh graders in the hallway, I mean, and, and bear with me, I was there long enough to, to know it. Like, my voice broke that up pretty good. You know, with two seventh graders in the hallway, I mean, that that's just that, that alone that can usually happen in solid. But administrators are trained in safety here in, in terms of how to break fights up and things like that. Like, you don't grab one kid's hands and <laughs> down that kid's defense list in a fight. Yeah. Like, like if there's, way, if there's ways of breaking up fights and things like that. But they, they, school, they do they all get training or just the teachers that are dealing with IEPs? It's, it's, it, it's the teachers that are in the higher, higher risk situations that have got So, and not the entire not staff? Not the entire staff. So, your answer is no. Answer is no. The answer is no. Okay. And, all right, because I just, I, 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 for whatever reason, that something made me feel like there was a. I've heard teachers say, when there's if there's kids fighting, like they can't interfere because they, they could get sued for, you know, how they restrain the student. No, um, I mean, we both like you know the old while. days when I was in school, the you know the, the men teachers would go in the hall and. Yeah. Basically, jack the kids up and smash them into a locker, and you know that is not like there done. Was no, I know you can't That's do not that. Done anymore. I know he can't do that anymore. That's my point. Is like, that is <laughs> like you know, how do you how do they break them up and not and make sure that they're not generally I mean, that they're separated by either who teachers involved. You don't want to have one teacher like Rob said, one teacher hold one student and yeah. Another. So usually it wouldn't when teachers there's certain teachers that feel comfortable, and once once again, like you said. Certain teachers have a way about them. They'll say, "Hey, guys, stop!" and the kids will, will presence stop. For, yeah. uh, it's presence. Well, well it's yeah. intimidation. Yeah. Good. Good. All right. Good. Any questions? Good on Any concerns on that one? All right. So, dot one is the the uh, weapons section. Um. So this is one that. Uh, it's just more, I guess, specifically defined. Um, there's a lot of different weapons that are added on here, I guess. I have a comment on the weapon definition. I was talking to a school board member or a former school board member in another district who had some legal training, and uh, he had mentioned that with these devices, um, like a cutting tool, like that those are scissors. They're not weapons per se. It's only a weapon if it's used to, you know, to commit some type of, I don't want to say crime, but some type of violent act. And in this definition, which comes from state law, so we can't change it, I just think it's interesting. Uh, any other tool, instrument, or implement capable of inflicting serious bodily injury. So really, per this definition, somebody's fists are Well, I think the weapon in and of itself isn't the issue. It's the weapon and in the possession. Like, why are you walking around school with a... Yeah, I don't think concealed, really, what I'm saying is a really concealed straight razor in your pocket, like yeah. you're not shaving, right? Like, or you're carrying around a pair of scissors in your pocket 24 hours a day. It's not because you're right. I mean, no, I I agree with you. Um, I do have a question about this under authority. I think our old language we had modified or discussed it. With that to include without uh, superintendent permission. I think we amended it because the replicas, the guns, the fake guns that they use in the, uh, was it in the uh, 
the GROTC? Oh, GROTC. Yeah, I think we had at one point amended that to include without specific approval from the superintendent. And he said that the board prohibits students from possessing and bringing weapons or replicas of weapons into any school district building, onto school property or school classroom where we do allow replicas with superintendent permission. Well, well, we own them, so it's a little... But those are given to the kids. Yeah, we own them. It's like rifles for marching band or something. Yeah. Like, we're, they're not they're not just bringing them in and, like, carrying them around. Well, it doesn't say, though, anything about property here. It just says that possession and bringing weapons or replicas are going to get to It doesn't say, it doesn't matter who owns them. Possession is defined as a student is in possession of a weapon when the weapon is found on the person oh, of the school. Well, <clears throat> well, even I wonder if we can even do that with that. If it's citing something from the code here, two and three, like we might not, that might be from the state code. We might not be able to offer exceptions, at least what they say there. But it does say in the next paragraph that, I mean, it's ultimately the board's, whether it's oh, yeah. punished, it's up to the board. They're actually allowing guns. There's well, something from Casper this week that allows super boards can allow guns in the schools now if they take the proper training. Now this may, this generally is implied that the student owns it because we would we wouldn't be able to have archery based on this. So once again, we have things in school that you. Could, I think well, possession. Well, I think possession. You could bring a javelin into the school on the bus. Like if you possession? if you read yeah right up above in the middle of the page. Under I definitions, it says they were the owner. no, but it, it basically says that it, the student is in possession of the weapon. That it, it suggests that they have they own it. They're not they're on school property versus they were given it given to it. I mean, like they they're using knives. They're using I mean wood shop. They're using all kinds of stuff. I mean, yeah, I thought that's what we had. If they floor, bring so that run, well, I guess this to, this is I think a bigger issue here. What is considered a replica? Like in some school districts, they say that uh, there was a the infamous case a few years back of a student who had a pop tart and he chewed it to look like a gun, and that student faced some type of disciplinary action. Like, does the replica itself have to be capable of inflicting seriously like, serious bodily injury? I think in that definition, because in that case, these rifles we're talking about aren't really replicas at all, because they're just made of wood, right? There's no like, mechanism in there even to do anything. Like, I'm trying to figure out well, how would how does our administration interpret what is a replica of a weapon? A replica is something that's not a real weapon. It's made to be just to look, look like it. Is it just to look like it though, or does yeah. it have some essential function? No, no function. It just has okay. to look like it. That's a replica. That's, I mean, there's better replicas than others. There's right. replicas with moving parts, God, and there's wood. Like, there are toys that scare kids. Yeah, I mean they look they look pretty real to me. Well I would still I would still feel more comfortable adding a little clause there that says without without uh, superintendent approval. Unless superintendent approval. That's my suggestion. That but by doing that, does that mean that Jim's got to approve all the stuff that's in the school that could be construed as a weapon? Or is it assumed to that be... That has to be done with his knowledge, yeah. I mean, I don't know, it has to be formal. I'm sure there's a whole bunch of case law on this. I don't know if it's worth consulting Brian, but I'm sure the courts have carved out specifically how this stuff can be applied and what circumstances and all of that. Because I don't even I don't even think it's like you can't even say if provided by the school because that would say that anything that's a could be like a knife that's in the school is now not a weapon because the school has it. Well, it says under the student's control. Uh, the the GRTC right. rifles aren't under a student's control; they're under our control. The, wep the, the the rifles for twirling are not under the student's control; they're under the band's control. Okay. Where does it say under the control? I mean, any cutting tool is under the workshop's control. Well, what if a student playing devil's advocate here takes one of those bright 
rifles, those replica rifles that beats a kid over the head. Well, that's assault. That's different. I mean, you that's can beat different. a kid over a book. We're still with a weapon. Yeah. But we can not charge him with having a weapon then. We can charge him with assault. But assault. I think we're kind of looking for holes in this, and I'm sure uh, I bet those holes in this are more still in the air. I'm right, well, looking for ways to, if the kid's not, you know, if it's not harmless, I don't want them, if it's a harmless yeah, I don't thing, want, I don't like, want the school to be exactly. run down with Like, if a kid it. were in the cafeteria to chew a Pop-Tart, like, happened in Philadelphia well, or wherever, I don't think that's... Then you could say not, not that was the superintendent consent, if he approves it. If he's brought to the superintendent, he says well, that's okay. Well, you can't approve it retroactively. Well, sure you're saying what? something... That's what I'm saying. If you put that in your policy, it also it also says if there's anything that's construed as a weapon, that we're supposed to notify the police, which means they can then come and interpret the law to the letter by saying, "Okay, not a big deal," or "Yeah, this is." Sometimes police so err on the side of no, oh, that's a violation when it not always is. But as long as there's common sense involved, like all applications of policy. stories that make the news about kids being hauled off in handcuffs because they have a, I don't know, like I said earlier, like a, a kid points his fingers like this and is charged with uh, violating the school weapon policy. I don't think that's appropriate. All right, terroristic threats. This is a brand new policy from PASBA. I think we had a, an old dog that's been replaced. I think there was a terrorist. I don't think I have one since I've been here. <laughs> we, we got more clown threats last year. We had a clown threat. Clown. Yeah, it's been like two years, right? Wasn't there one going around Berks County? Yeah, we, we dodged the bullet for a couple of years. I might get a threat tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think their big thing here was, like, the uh, uh, the big one is the updating of the, how the, how, the, how it's communications defined. Like, it covers, like, texts and any electronics. So, like, if students are making threats to other kids, that's against the policy. It's not just a bomb threat. It's, like, any any... As they define it, it's anything where you're technically, you know, potentially harming another student or or the school. We're including over telex. Yeah. I don't even know how. I don't even know how telex works. Mm -hmm. Is that same as fax? No, fax is a little bit different. What is telex? Right. Any any questions or concerns on this one? All right. Um, four, uh, 247. Hazing. Is this, how is that different from bullying? Hazing is, um... Is this more like sports related or yeah. club related? Mm -hmm. It's like an initiation. So it's a subsection of the I'd say. It's like a membership. I like the one with the Affiliated with a membership in any organization. Does this stuff go on? Kind of a shame. I mean, <laughs> there was always that kind of stuff in when I was in school. The, like the 
all the different clubs had, I mean, they weren't brutal. They were, you know, more of a, They threw you out of the locker room. Yeah, maybe. like, whatever. Like, they'd tape you to the goalpost or... Where they'd make, you know, all the freshmen carry all the bags and get all this, Like, that was just kind of a normal thing. And today, that would be, uh... would be frowned upon. All right. Any can... Any, uh... Any questions or concerns on this one? Um, I do a question. Last page. An investigation results in a substantiated finding the coach, sponsor, or volunteer affiliated student activity organization engaged in, condoned, or ignored any violation of this policy. He shall be disciplined in accordance with work policy and applicable laws and regulation. Well, what is the work policy on an adult who does anything specified there? I don't think we have a work policy that says that. I'm thinking it's just a, a general discipline policy. Like, oh, okay. like, you didn't follow the policy, therefore we're allowed to do this. Like, we can... That's, it's not a... I don't think it's specific to the... It's like if you're looking the other way, you're in violation of a policy and they can discipline you accordingly. So I guess there's a faculty or a staff discipline policy somewhere that lays out like the levels of infractions. I don't know which section it would be. I guess it would be the staff or the 400 series or 500 or 600. I guess y'all will get there eventually. Yeah, right. Well, uh, three more years, right? Spice. Three more years, we'll get to those other sections. So they, uh, wasn't that their response? All right, homeless students. We, we talked about this earlier. Um, there's not a whole lot of changes to this. Yeah, this is all homeless is all governed by the King Vento and that, that law. Um, the the essence of it, I think we can speak to this here. Uh, the essence of the law is if, if, if a child is um, forced from their housing, say for an eviction or things like that, then if they are if they're across the border, if they're living in Potsdam, we're still responsible for transporting that child over over and back into our school district because of the educational best interest of that child. Um, it's what the federal law is. Yeah. We do in consultation with the school district in which they're residing, and when we have a disagreement, which sometimes there are disagreements in regards to that, um, we reach out to um, one of the members of the and we get some ourselves to the students. Where it, where it gets real gray, guys, is where when it's um, cyber schools involved, because there's tuition in the charter schools, and that's where it gets really gray. Some of them are kind of black and white. And, uh, What's the limit? Since you mentioned Potsdam versus Daniel Bone. I'll give you uh, I'll, I'll give you an example of one that I challenged. Um, when, when you start skipping a district like over in the far end of Springfield, um, it starts to get usually bordering districts rules of thumb. And I use rules of thumb as a different for every yeah. child, but I, I just try to like and that's not always you know what I mean, because of kind of where they live in the situations that that's been. Um, the the one you do have to change the title. Um, they have like the person who says is specific and says the person in charge is coordinator of instructional services. Um, that's me. I do that, so we don't have a person who would like to do that, per se, that before. Where, where are you reading that, Rob? Um, it said, they, for some reason, it gave a title of the position that the person Coordinator, page two of three, first line that under was delegation of response. I don't know why they did okay. that. You just say the board designates the assistant and superintendent. We should just say the board designates the superintendent or his designate. Perfect. Uh, that works. So then he, then the All right. title is changed. A Telex machine is pretty much a typewriter that's connected to a printer and a network. So it's kind of like a fax, except you type right to the machine. It's like an older version.
<laughs> that was old school. Yeah. In the 1950s. Unless the rest of the district still That's like in the, you know, WW2 in stuff, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Hiring. It's like WW2. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Any other Maybe edits too. that you see, that was, Rob? That was good. All right. Well, I don't know. You have never been up to All right, next, educational stability for children in foster care. This is a new policy. Uh, foster care, I can, I'll add some color to that, guys. Um, this legislation is new. Um, it's another one of those mandates that are unfunded by the government. But uh, in essence, foster care students are now treated very, in a very similar manner than homeless students. The idea is continuity of education. Um, what the federal government doesn't want um, in regards to what people's beliefs are. They don't want kids having to switch schools every three weeks as a result of going from foster care family to foster care family. Um, it, it basically obligates us in regards to transportation to the, to the child. And, and is that what most of this is about, is the transportation? Uh, a lot, both of these things, honestly, a lot of it is arranging transportation. There are other things, too, like, um, that, without going into great detail, like, terms of free and reduced lunches yeah, and yeah, stuff yeah. like that. But, but it really, it, it's making sure there's continuity of instruction. Because most, under foster care, aren't they, I mean, they're typically within the same county, right? Yeah, and they can. So, I mean, if they shift around, they're going to be in the same county. They may not be in our district, but they exactly. would more than likely stay in the county. Yeah, like I just had one two or three days ago, literally, and uh, what happens is the child goes to one family, and then they're, for whatever reason, it doesn't work out, and so they end up in another foster care. Um, it can happen two or three times until they find that a long term placement for that child. And so it's, they basically don't want the kid change the schools every three weeks, is what they're trying to get from now. Which is very similar to what almost is. Do we have to submit the local transportation plan, including any updates or revisions to the Pennsylvania Department of Education? We already have it, it's all online, it's all done. Okay. Do we have to do that with our transportation anyway? Or like are we set bus routes and those have to go to PDE or some agency? Um, the what I can tell you specific to these groups, I mean basically there are informal agreements between I'm not informal, but they, they we try to work with other districts so we're not we're not spending a fortune on kids, you know, like okay, we, we take them to this spot, you work with us here, pick them up here. And, Actually, and I need to give Ron a lot of credit on this. Ron does a really good job, and he helps me with this type of stuff and try to piece it all together for these kids. Liability. What's that? Liability. Like if we're if we're in short, we're in short for for sure. Like it would be like, like a suck. If we're taking an Exeter child one of our buses, mm -hmm. we're in short. We're in short. That's the bus company. You good on this? I'm good. good. Carol. Scott, you good? Yes. And Connor. Yeah. All right. Um, Six twenty-seven. Post issuance tax compliance procedures for tax exempt bonds. This sounds like a fun policy. <laughs> I went over this in great detail. I don't like any of it. Just kidding. So you have a recommendation for this? <laughs> yeah. This sounds like a lot like one one thirteen, but a different different chapter. Well, this is the one that Brian Super's created. So given that our attorney's the one who drafted this, I would I don't I don't know how I'm gonna how we're in a position to well, maybe we approved a motion or something, but never actually put it in policy. I guess it doesn't matter. Since we're going to be doing this again, probably, right? And I don't think any of not that, I mean, we'll at least have the debate about whether or not we want to do it again. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think this is just that we had to, you know, be compliant with something. It really doesn't, I don't think, impact any of our operations. And I think, you know, we need to nice outline. All right, I'm going to move up. Uh, food allergies, uh, 209.1. How's that? Oh. Sound like someone getting a tooth drilled. Didn't it? Um, 209.1. Food allergy management. Rob, you know anything? Yeah, I mean, this is in result of Act 86. Um, that this is here, and basically, there's a couple of provisions in here, and the, the policy is fine as it's written. Um, but what it, it requires is when in Act 80, I'm going to Act 86, I may not have mentioned it in, in the policy itself, but the parents, um, they can, believe it or not, we just, I put this out to our principals, they're putting it in their handbook. Parent can opt out of food allergy treatment medically for their kid. It says that. Um, it basically says that it, the other thing it does is it does um, help in regards to if um, civil liability, if um, someone is trained in regards to administering like EpiPens and stuff like that. It helps in some regards there. So if someone is doing a Good Samaritan Act doesn't get um, hammered by it, uh, some sort of frivolous loss and things of that nature. Um, so that, that type of stuff you'll see in there. Um, it does, the, it allows students and um, to, uh, with the parents' permission, um, and guys, what we're talking about potentially is at high school level, this is another significant thing, where they can self-administer um, their own, like, EpiPen and things like that. We're really talking about, generally, you know, kids who are proven that they're responsible and capable of doing those things. If we have a kid that... No a student that we know has a significant allergy to something that's common, like peanuts, or do we have any responsibility to ensure they have an EpiPen or a, a way to, to handle it if they go into shock? Or? We have, we have um, the kids who have school, we're aware they have, kids who have those type of allergies, assuming the parents report those things to us, um, they're generally, they're, they have what's called a 504 plan. Um, which basically makes the necessary people aware of the situation. Um, they, the parent then provides the school with what's called the heavy pen yeah. injector. Um, the, I, I can tell you. Because every student could have their own heavy pen. Yeah, they have their own. Now, there, there Do we are, have them in case there's there an issue? Times, yeah. There are times in the, in, the, in the real world where, and I've, I've seen this happen, where a parent doesn't identify that a child or it was an unknown allergy and um, and then we find out, and the, um, the nurses typically have these on hand in a spare every pen. Well, they absolutely and sure they, they do. do. I mean, we've used it in buildings, and so um, we typically yeah. do And that's within our, like, we're able to, we're allowed to do that for the, nur the, the nurse or whoever's. Those, that yeah. Type of yeah so okay, as long as they're the ones making the decision, we're good. I mean, I can literally, back when I was a building principal, we had a, a situation. Well, the whole, yeah, just like the Good Samaritan law doesn't apply here, right? Like at school, you're, something bad happens here, even if you're trying, yeah, but I'm saying, if you're trying to do something like administer an EpiPen and you're just a teacher and it doesn't work out, are we liable for that? What's that? Like if, is only, is it, and this isn't necessarily part of this policy, Rob, as much as just a general question. Can any teacher or anyone administer an EpiPen? Or is it well, the students are taught. Like, for example, <laughs> I'll tell the swimming event one. My son uses an EpiPen. He he was eating so much peanuts at the high school, he went through his couple that he had. At a swim meet, his wife How's this for used his <laughs> the daughter's EpiPen because he ate nuts at a swim event again that he shouldn't have had. So he had to replace it. So my son, who has the plan, knows how to, it's just a pop it in the leg, so it's kind of idiot proof. Mm -hmm. They just got recalled lately. So he ate peanuts, he had it, then he ate them again? He, he ate, some girl gave him a brownie or something oh. with nuts in it at the okay. swim event, because it's a girl and he's a boy. And then he also ate stuff at the high school, so like two days before, that's like three days in a row he was using his EpiPen, because he's 
not that he's a high school kid. So the funny part about it, they didn't even know. Like they, like they, neither one of us was there. <laughs> yeah. So they didn't even know. Like my wife didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Was, but if a teacher has to administer it, like no, the kids do it. The kids just it, it hits right in the leg. It's kind of idiot. Even like an elementary kid? Yeah, you just hit it right in the leg. You, I mean, they're Doesn't trained come to do out it. Until there's pressure on the tip. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not. I mean, again, it's not related. They would be trained. A, a teacher is, if, if it is an assessment, they would, I mean, if they, they would be training, a nurse would be asked the teacher to do it without the appropriate training. All right. Yeah, just make sure that you are in order to avoid that potential liability that the parent, we make sure that we have all the documents on hand that we need to per this policy. If we just make sure that we're following this to the team. This ties in with nutrition. Well, they would compile a list of all the allergies, dairy, wheat, gluten, red dye number two, all of those things, and the students, and they, when it comes up, they, they, they shush up on the students. They would get the medical care plan. Okay. That's common. All right, so we're okay on that one? Yeah. Team? Same one, the food allergies. Yeah, that's pretty much what we're, we're doing. We're dealing with this. And the replicants are coming back. Okay. Thank you. All right. 2010 or uh, 2010. I actually spoke to one of just to make sure we were just saying. I think there's something about them being reviewed annually. And our nurses are all, I actually know. They're all with us. Thank you. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Perfect. 210 medications. This one too? Yeah, and how about 210.1? Yeah. Everything, they're good with all those. I reviewed yeah. it with the all the, all the All the medication ones. Yeah, we, I reviewed every one of them. You're the man. All standing medication orders and parentheses shall be reviewed at the beginning of each right. year. Yeah. The whole thing about class trips and everything, like if a parent doesn't go, the kid doesn't go, and all that. To all that practice. Yeah, generally speaking, we try to get a nurse on on a we try to get a nurse on one trip. Just, to, we try to because wow. just it's a risk management yeah. use that we really try to do that yeah. because the risk reward of that is we don't want something happening. Uh, does the wow. um, allergy policy require that the Administer. Because it says here on page two of three, students may possess and use asthma inhalers and epinephrine auto injectors when permitted in accordance with state law and board policy. Mm -hmm. so it's also board policy say that students may use it. It's the next policy. Next Actually, policy is specifically, um, okay. yeah, to so ten like more. Oh, yeah. They're all tied policy together. Great. Right. Okay. So it's good. I, I, I have no problem with it if they review it. Thank you, Mr. Lincoln. Everybody good on those? Yep. 2-9, 2 and 2-10-1. Are we all good on those? Good. Now we have to review that. Nursing staff, or do you want to be good? Do you want to keep that? Yeah, I think I'm good. I'm still scared. We can move on. Uh, 211 is student accident insurance. Guys, I'm going to flag this one for a second. Um, currently, 
currently being mandated. They are not required, it's not yes. mandated for the yes. students to purchase. We're, we're putting a mandate yes. here if we pass this as yes, it's just an offer. They, but we, we currently, they're not mandated to play extracurricular sports. They're not mandated. We have, our, we have an insurance policy as a district. We don't, it is not currently mandated that they purchase. Now, most people do have it, their own insurance, but it's not mandated that they purchase their own thing. Um, so this could be an additional expense for them. Um, we do offer, for you, for, for your knowledge, I'm just trying to give you background as you discuss this, um, they all, people can purchase separate insurance for non-extracurricular activities, and I'm shooting from the hip here, but I think it's about $8 or something like that for a typical situation. Um, I did that, but that does not cover extracurricular, it says it right in the um, actual, if you look at the insurance stuff itself. So this is an additional requirement um, if we're passing it for ex extracurricular activities. So just be aware of that. We can do it. We can get a quote from the insurance company. No trouble whatsoever. Um, now I got to tell you, most kids have the have the insurance, and we, uh, you know, and I spoke with Lawrence. And we do have our own our own insurance for this. But um, the question is, do we want to mandate them to ha have their personal insurance on top of that? And that's obviously. I, gotta love that. I thought this just said we had to offer it. Where's it? No. We used to say we had to offer the old policy. That was my concern too. This is saying we have to, they have to, shall require parents to purchase the student accident insurance available through the school district or provide proof of comparable insurance no. prior to the student's participation. And that's yeah, that we me. don't do. That's a huge, it's contrary to my experience. You also just provide the proof of it. We never have to provide proof of it. They, they do have to, they do provide they do provide the insurance generally for the um, for the athletic training for the physical. So I mean, if the parents opted out, we they just opted out. Of it. Yeah, currently, the, yeah, currently, you it's not a mandate. It is, you are correct. It's not. I think a we need to find out what the genesis of this is. It's Obamacare. Obamacare requires insurance coverage. This is just another way of making sure that the student is covered. Because if you're not, you're penalized. So that's how this So if they opt out, do they have to provide proof that they have some type of insurance? Yeah, and that's what this says. This says they need to. This is big. I see this as a big thing. What did they be covered under? What exactly happens now when a student doesn't have this insurance? Do they have to provide proof of that they have the insurance? Just sign the parents. It's on the parents. Right, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we should require it then. We don't want to require it, but I think Jim might be saying we might be required. Well, this is part of the Affordable Care Act in other states. You have to prove you have insurance. If not, you're, you're penalized. Right, that's, that's what not it's specifically in regard to school. This isn't, well, helping, one, this this isn't really health insurance, though. This, this is different. This doesn't say you no, 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 this is saying you have to be covered. If not, you have to purchase our insurance. So they're making sure that the student is covered. That was part of the Affordable Care Act. You, they they made just, sure that... So if you're covered by general health care, you're fine? Yeah, if you have... Blue Cross Blue I thought Shield. this was like yeah. over and above insurance. That you no, have. no. This is your family insurance. This is, this is your, okay. but now when you sign up, your son goes to play football. You have to show something that he's covered under your policy, which we don't have to do now. So if you don't have health insurance, you can get accident insurance. I think this might be. No, this shows that you have to get it. Now. This doesn't say health insurance. It says accident, accident insurance, which is different than from health insurance. Well, well, accident. Why we Rob, who, 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 who can clarify this for us? You offer the child Rob, accident insurance Rob, for that specific. Who could cover this? Who could, who could clarify this? Yeah, 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 let's get some clarity. Is is it how necessary is it? Is it crime? This is what I talked about. This is what we're really getting into technical things. What's legal? Yeah. What's legal? What's legal? What's legal? What's legal? What's legal? I'm what I wanted to share with you guys is that we don't require this currently. Right. This is right. a major change. And this is a requirement. Price in general, when it's non-athletic, in general, in athletics, we're more expensive to ensure. So if it's close to 100 bucks there, it's going to cost more money for, I would think, for a family. So we just want to be aware of what we're mandating. Right. Now, it's not a large portion. Most, most well, why is PASBA saying we have to mandate it? Well, if you right, read the, the references here, which I'm trying to go through, I'm not seeing that pass. It says May affiliate. May. I'm not sure we have to. Yeah, I don't think it does. I think it would be a burden on our administration, too, to administer this policy. 
Every I school know activity. Is Every extra. Well, like, imagine all the, you know, how long. Cheerleader, the band. This is a full time job, dude. It, it just, it's just something else that's on the form that someone has to sign off on, and you review the form. So we would have to change our, our forms to show what, what insurance coverage are you under. That's all. And if none, we have to get it for them. I have no, not question. get it for them. The require Panther Gardens to participate. This is a specific Daniel Boone consideration here. I'm wondering, or, um, the student has shall require parents and guardians to participate in interscholastic sport, cheerleader program, and band program, and designated extracurricular programs. Is that? If we're just in the high school band program, we can say that, but this makes it sound like it's the entire band program, which would include elementary schools. I don't know if we wanted to include that. I mean, they do have a few. We should change that to say, actually, we're even striking and just designated that we're qualified for cheerleader. Anymore. I don't understand why language seems to contradict itself. And if we do pass this, we're going to have to designate certain extracurricular programs requiring this. Not just all inclusive, requires a designation. This, feel, this, this seems like kind of incomplete, this policy, yeah, this the way it's written. Because yeah. well, it doesn't. This paragraph says the board shall require a purchase of the student asset, and then the next the subsequent <laughs> paragraph says the board shall provide at no cost to the board the opportunity to purchase insurance. So which is it? Do we no, have to provide the opportunity, or do we have to? Oh, we have to require it and I think, provide I, the opportunity. I think okay. to summarize what you guys are okay. saying here, I think we should put it in your column for legal review. Yeah. Why yep. yeah, let's do that. There's all kinds of different things associated with the With a note that this is completely different from what we're, contrary to what we're practicing right so now. So we'll put that for a way to legal. I think it's a good thing to do. Yeah, wave that for legal. Yeah. Perfect. You're okay with that, guys? I'm going to put it on the note. Got it. Yeah. Let's see if it's necessary. change it dramatically. How, how great would it be if we could get through all these policies tonight? All right. I think you uh, the clock over there. You're trying to one. All right, 212. 212. Reporting student progress. The world's shortest uh, yeah. policy. And that's again. That's it's pretty much what we're practicing. Yeah, it's what I'm practicing. I read. They've added some. They've changed the language. To add guardian to parent. Parent. I like that it says all appropriate staff members shall comply with this because I, I heard from some administrators in the past that there hasn't always been buy-in when it comes to some of this stuff. Mm. This is now saying that it's part of your job. So forever that's work. Really. Oh, and and your ample warning of a pending risk of failure. Yeah. So, so do we set notes so the child is at risk of failing the course? Okay. Yeah. I like it. It's good. All right. Class rank. Wait a minute. I have one here. What is this? This actually just says that it must that it will be done. It seems to be uh, addressing the end of uh, if there's a tie thing where the next person uh, rank is, and it just clarifies that, that it's the next. The rank of the student who immediately follows the tied position will be determined by the number of students preceding it, not by the rank of the preceding person. I know there's been some confusion about that with kids placing and misreporting their placing to schools or something. They weren't second, they were third because they were tied. Some well, the if, you're, if there's three tied people tied at second, the next person isn't third, their they're ranking is like fourth, fourth or fifth, or whatever. Yeah. It's so like how they, it's how they, it's how they, that's good. Ain't if you look at how they do golf, like your finish position is based on how many people are in front of you, not the number of that that's all there. That. So, you don't have a problem with that. And I will share this with you. Uh, although I'm not, I don't think we're, we're there. This is a kind of one right now. Some districts are even moving away from from right yeah. now. That, that can open up a huge can of worms. It would be a lot more thoughtful conversation. Let's talk about the whole class, right? Do we want to let the policy?
I mean, it's a policy. I mean, like, all they're saying is it's just determining how you want to, I think where you come in is we want to continue to do it. It's yes. not how it's calculated. It's just the policy. I think the policy as is, it could change. Yeah, we could push. I'm fine. If Connor's group wants to debate yeah, whether or not we should even have a class yeah. rank, then they can. All right. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm okay if they, with if they say we're not going to do it, then we'll just remove yeah. the policy. As long as it's in practice, this is a good policy. Right. Until, okay. until they I decide agree. something different, we'll go with it. I agree. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Yeah. On your little note pad, future conference. And I'm not sure if our computer system does it this way. We have to be careful of that. Keep going or stop there? All right. Go ahead. Check it out. 215, promotion and retention. That's pretty standard, as I recall. As long as it's what we're currently practicing. <coughs> Retention means I'm holding them back. Is that what that is? Yeah, this is, yeah. Yeah. This is card practice. I got no problems with it. I think it spells it out nicely. Ability to. Uh, this is a record breaking. I mean. Academic standards for our subjects. This is a record breaking session. All right. You're all it's witnessing good. greatness well, right now. The recommendation of the classroom teacher shall be required. What Two more. That I had a question. Yeah, what about the high school? What about high school? Uh, yeah. Who is the recommendation in high school? Guy the homeroom teacher. I'm glad you mentioned that. The recommendation of the high school, of the classroom uh, teacher. On delegation of responsibility, second section. Yeah. Oh, hold. Recommendation of the classroom teacher shall be required for promotion or retention of a student. Let me do another review of this scenario. Sorry. Good. That's uh, fine. It gets it out of my <laughs> Although ultimately it says the building principal shall be assigned the final response. Student records. Maybe we just want to put. I swear we've gone through this already before too. We talk about records. Student records. We talk about this a lot. Yes. Stop there. Okay. Thanks. Take a little break. Everybody get a break. People are going to start pounding. I think the kids are here to whatever. Filling up. We got all but three done, so I still think that's good.